I want to talk about two effects that you may be hearing about in the news lately, but you may not understand what they are or what the background is of them, even if you have a basic understanding of what they're referencing to. These are the uh, Bradley effect and the Streisand effect. And let me start first with the Bradley effect. The Bradley effect references a governor's race in California back in 1982. Tom Bradley, former mayor of Los Angeles, an African-American, the first African-American mayor of Los Angeles, maybe the last African-American mayor of Los Angeles, I'm not quite sure, was running for governor of California. His opponent was George Dugmajian, a white a person of uh, Armenian heritage who was a Republican. And they were in this relatively tight race. Somewhere along the line, someone or some group inside the Bradley campaign decided to make race an issue. And they did that by sort of hinting that if you weren't supporting Tom Bradley, who was black, and you were supporting George Dukmajian, who was white, it might be because of racism. So they ejected that, injected that, excuse me, into the debate. And Tom Bradley was ahead in the polls. Not only was Tom Bradley ahead in the polls going into the election, on election day, as people came out after they had voted and they did the exit polling, Tom Bradley won the exit polls. So the media was all ready to report that Tom Bradley was going to be the next governor of California. Of course, they can't do that until the polls close. Lo and behold, when the polls close and the votes start coming in, guess what? Tom Bradley didn't win. George Dukmajian won. And that's the birth of the Bradley effect. And the basic idea is now different people interpret it a little one way or the other. But uh, the way I interpret it is when you inject race into a political contest, because people don't want to think of themselves or have other people think of them as racists, they'll lie to the pollsters. In the Bradley case, they actually lied to the ex exit pollsters. So what that means is when you have make race an issue in a campaign, the polls will probably be off and will probably reflect that by over polling support for one given candidate. Now, if you apply that to uh, 2016 and 2020, where the Democrats inject constantly race into the issue, you know, if you support Donald Trump, you're a racist. I mean, I had a friend I had known in, in early 2017. I had known him since we were 13. I was, uh, what was I? I was 64, 65 at the time. This is a guy I'd known for a half century, more than a half century. And when he found out I voted for Trump, he called me a racist and defriended me on Facebook. That's what we're talking about here. So people don't want other people to think of them as racist, so they lie to the pollsters. So when you look at the polls today, and it, certainly race has been injected into this race, election race, and especially when you've got, you know, Kamala Harris on the ticket, who is a woman of color. The question is, how accurate will the polls be? And if you look at the Bradley effect, you could expect that the Biden ticket will over poll. And some of the people telling the pollsters that they're going to support Biden are really going to support Donald Trump. The question is, how many of them are there? And how do you figure that into your poll? And they really don't know how to do that. But as soon as you see race get injected into a poll, a political poll, you know you should assume that the poll itself is inaccurate by some degree. You don't know how much it is. We won't know until it's all over. And even then you won't know because people may even lie to the exit pollsters. So that's the Bradley effect, simply put. 
And I do think it's playing a role. We don't know how big a role. But imagine, you know, imagine if you're an African-American on election day and you come out of a polling booth and you just voted for Donald Trump for whatever reason. And the guy says to you, who did you vote for, Biden or Trump? And there are people around. You're going to say, yeah, I voted for Donald Trump. Or you're going to say, uh, I, I, of course I'm black. I voted for Joe Biden. So we, you can expect that there's the polls are off, basically, because of the Bradley effect. And that's the reference. And if somebody's not referencing the Bradley effect with regard to the polls, then you ought to know about it when you look at the polls, because you know there's that effect in there somewhere. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's 5%, who knows? I think in the Dumagian case, it was, it was something like 4 or 5%. It was, it was pretty large. But that's the Bradley effect. Now I'm going to talk about now about the Streisand effect. And then in the next section of this video, if you stick with me, I'll explain why it's important for what's happening today and how I think American journalists may have cost the Democrats the election. But that, that's going to come next. The Streisand effect, 2005, a environmental group, not a right wing outfit, an environmental group decides they're going to start this program to photograph the coast of, I don't know, it was all of California, or the southern part of California, which is, is a normal process. We used to do this when I worked for the Corps of Engineers. You know, we would do the Jersey Coast, Manasquan to Cape May every year. And then you can tell how the beaches are changing, drifting, eroding by comparing the pictures over a series of years. So it's a good archive to have. So what they wanted to do was to start photographing the California coast to document coastal erosion. Good plan. So he went about photographing the coast. Now, one of the places they did along the coast was a mansion at the top of a height over on a cliff overlooking the ocean. And it's actually a very nice picture if you see it. You've got the ocean, you've got the big, tall cliff with all the rocks and stuff. And at the top, there's this beautiful mansion. Now, the photograph, which was put online in their database, they didn't identify the house or any of the houses. They just had numbers. I don't remember what the number of this was like. It was a four digit number, 4640 or something like that. So you had four, photograph 4640 and you could download it. Now, it just so happened that that particular house was the mansion that belonged to the actress, singer, celebrity, Barbara Streisand. Yeah, Babs, her. And somehow it came to her knowledge that her house was in this archive and that people could download a photograph of her house, which she didn't like. So she asked them to take that photograph down and they said, no, you know, we didn't identify it as your mansion. We're just doing the whole coast. We're out on the ocean. You know, we're not trespassing on your land. You can't tell us to take this house down. Sorry, no. So she decided to sue them. Now, the day she sued them, that photograph had been downloaded a grand total of six times. Two of the downloads were by her lawyers, which means a grand total of four people other than her lawyers had downloaded that picture. When the news story broke that she was suing this organization to get the picture removed, you can guess what happened. In the next 30 days, next month after the lawsuit, I don't remember the exact number, it was somewhere between three and 400,000 people downloaded that photograph. Some people downloaded it because it was you know, Barbara Streisand's mansion. Some people downloaded it, maybe they liked the photograph. It is a nice photograph. And if you go to Wikipedia and type in Streisand effect and search for it, when it comes up, that photograph's right at the top. So there is Barbara Streisand's mansion, the photograph of it that she tried to get killed on Wikipedia. And it's the first thing you see when you type in Streisand effect. Or if you go to her biography, 
the Streisand effect thing will come up. You click on that, it takes you there, bang, there's the photograph again. So God knows millions, tens of millions, maybe I don't know how many millions of people have downloaded and seen that photograph. That's the Streisand effect. You try to kill something, you try to suppress something, and you actually bring attention to it. So rather than preventing people from seeing or getting hold of a photograph of her mansion, she actually, through her actions, besides the fact that she lost money in the suit, uh, actually caused more attention to that photograph than ever would have happened if she had just kept her mouth shut and not brought attention to it. Like I said, it wasn't listed as Barbara Streisand's mansion. It was just, you know, picture uh, 4621, 4640, 4660, whatever the hell it was. I don't remember what the number was. I'm pretty sure it was a four-digit number. Streisand effect. And of course, that's a relevant today because of what we see with the story about Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and things that went on in the Ukraine and China, and as they were published by the New York Post. The New York Post published their story several days ago. Right away, social media tried to squash it. Twitter, Facebook, boom. I mean, I tried to share it the story from to Twitter didn't work. Same with Facebook. Facebook has since stopped blocking, but not Twitter. This morning before I uh, shot this video, I tried to repost from the New York Post and it wouldn't let me. Now, what I could do was just take a block quote out, copy and paste, and punch it as enough that it would fit into a Twitter feed and punch it into Twitter and that went up. The other odd thing about Twitter is, and this gets back to the whole Streisand effect thing, they've only drawn more attention to the story, I think. If they think that this is going to help Joe Biden and the Democrats, I think, you know, they should know better. Because they're not blocking everything. It's, it's, it's almost as if it's like a picture, you've got a 12-lane superhighway, and Twitter decides to erect a toll booth on one lane but the other lanes are still free. I mean, I can't repost something from a New York Post, but a similar story from Fox News goes through. Uh, the other day was a story from USA Today about efforts to block the story. That went through. Uh, British newspapers have been covering the story. They go through. So they only seem to be focusing on the New York Post. I didn't have the New York Post app on my current Android phone. I had it on my old Apple phone, but I switched April 1st, actually, this year. And I, you know, had so many apps. I had over 200 apps on my iPhone. Basically, when I switched over to Android, except for the ones I need every day, the other ones I installed as I need them. Until the story broke, I had not installed the New York Post app, which suggests that between, you know, mid-October and April 1st, I had never bothered to go to the New York Post. But you can imagine what happened right after that. New York Post app is now on my phone, and I check it two or three times a day to see what's coming out of there. And I'm sure other people have done the same thing. So this has probably been a huge boon to the New York Post in terms of their uh, app traffic and you know, online ads and stuff like that for them. It's probably breaking in lots of clicks and money and maybe even subscriptions, I don't know. But it's certainly been good for them. It's not been good uh, for Twitter or Facebook. I mean, as I said, Facebook has stopped blocking. Maybe they're getting ready for the hearings next week so they can at least claim, oh, we don't do that anymore, we already stopped. We made a mistake, we realized that we backed off. But not Twitter. Twitter said they handled it badly, but they're still blocking it. You still, at least this morning when I tried, I could not share a story from the New York Post website. I tried just copying the URL and pasting that into a tweet. Wouldn't even let me do that. If this New York Post shows up in the URL, you're going to get blocked. But comments on that story or coverage of that story from, say, uh, a British newspaper or another U.S. outlet, they go through. So again, it's, you know, 11 lanes are open, one lane's closed. Or as I've used the description before, an elephant trying to stop on ants. I mean, they can't do it. And it's probably just stirring up the nest of ants and there's more ants crawling around 
because of what they've done. And they're going to go into Congress next week, and Jack Dorsey's going to have to explain why the New York Post is still blocked. And, you know, it's a, the number, of, I think, number four, the fourth largest circulation of a newspaper in this country, and they're blocked on Twitter. But that's not a challenge to freedom of the press. Anyway, that's that. And I think that relates to the Streisand effect. Think about this for a second. This Biden, Hunter Biden story has been around for months. I mean, in many ways, it's been around since Joe bragged before the Council of Foreign Relations that he had used his position as point man for Ukraine in the Obama administration to threaten Ukraine with holding up a billion dollar loan package unless they fired the guy who was investigating Burisma, which, on which his son just happened to be on the board of directors. I mean, that's really what began this whole story. It's Joe Biden's own fault, which is interesting because, you know, that's his own fault. And forgetting the laptop at the Mac repair shop is Hunter's own fault. You know, it makes you wonder just how bright are the Bidens. But let's set that aside for a minute. Now, throughout this whole thing, while people on the right, and people at Fox News have been saying, hey, you know, What's going on with Biden? What went on with Biden in the Ukraine? Why did he take his son to China? I mean, it was a picture of him getting off uh, Air Force Two with his son. Why is his son there? Why did he fly Hunter Biden to China? You know, was that part of something bigger? And of course, the mainstream media just said, well, we're, we're not going to go there. There's nothing to this. Joe denied it. We're not going to investigate. And now, a couple of weeks before the election, boom, you got an October surprise. The laptop services. Now you got this guy Tony Wawelinski and his his three cell phones with all the text messages and uh, emails on them. Lord knows what else they got. Pictures, rumors about pictures. The FBI taking the thing. Questions. I mean, I, uh, I won't even speculate about some of the things I've heard. I don't want to get blocked on YouTube. <laughs> but let's let's say. Just for the sake of argument, imagine this. Imagine that the mainstream media and its journalists did their job. That back when this story started emerging, late winter, early spring, some budding Woodward and Bernsteins had decided to investigate. Now, what would have happened? There's two possible outcomes. The one is they would have found that this story is true that Joe Biden and Hunter were running this family corruption deal. If they had done that and published that story, maybe in April or May, any point before the Democrat National Convention, the Democrats would have had time to get a different candidate. Maybe, maybe it would have been Bernie, who was the sort of a number two guy with delegates. Maybe they could have picked him. Bernie and I don't know, Kamala Harris. But that didn't happen. And it, it may be he's you know, involved in all this corruption. And the problem right now the Democrats have is, I mean, they can say it's Russian collusion and dismiss it all they want, but it's there. And every week there's a new story. Every day there's a new story. And my guess is if I was doing some timing on this and I was the New York Post and Fox News, the stuff will come out uh, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday of this coming week. Because Monday is not a good day. Friday is not a good day. Saturday and Sunday is too close to the election. Monday's the day before. It doesn't really matter. So I would think Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday next week, we'll see some more dramatic stuff. Uh, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday week before the November 3rd election. That's what I think. We'll see what happens. But if, if the media, the journalists had gone in and discovered this and found out that it was true, the Democrats could have gotten rid of Biden which I think would have been good because I think he's been a terrible candidate, you know, sitting in his basement doing not much of anything, going out, you know, with his mask and making gaffes. And, you know, the other night, what did he say to Trump? Uh, I never said I was going to end fracking or fossil fuel. You know, show me the tape. You know, the commercial was out the next morning, you know, with several scenes with Biden saying, you know, I'm going to end fracking, I'm going to end fossil fuel, blah, 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 blah. 
I mean, he just walked right into that one. It was really dumb. But if they had found this out, they could have gotten rid of them. It's too late now. There's nothing they can do. They're just going to have to ride this out and hope it doesn't cost them the election, which I think, I think they were going to lose anyway, but I think this will make the loss even bigger. Alternatively, had the journalists started investigating months ago and the story really isn't true or it's blown out of proportion or it's been misrepresented and that Biden and Hunter really weren't engaged in anything that was nefarious or even criminal and maybe just a little, little kind of shady, but not really a little. If they had done that and dismissed the story and put it away, then to the extent that that would have done damage back in April or May, by September and October, it would be gone. Nobody would be talking about it much. It wouldn't matter anymore. It would have, it would have you know, expended its energy well before November 3rd, 2020. And that would have been it. So I think in either scenario, the Democrats would have been better served if the media had done its job months ago and investigated this. By not doing that, now it's too late to jettison Joe if he's guilty. And if he's not guilty, it's too late to fully clear him. Both of those results are bad for Joe Biden and good for Donald Trump. In that sense, they're good for the Republicans and bad for the Democrats. So I think it's ironic, but I would argue that the mainstream media's powerful effort to suppress this story and to not even cover it, which has gone on for months now, you could even argue almost a year, actually worked to Donald Trump's advantage. I know they thought they were doing the Democrats a favor. I know they thought they were, you know, in terms of, you know, tilting the scale in favor of Joe Biden. But they may actually be tilting the scale in favor of Donald Trump. And, and, you know, we'll see what happens. We've got another week and a half to go. But I think that's very conceivable. You know, sometimes you try to help somebody and you actually end up hurting them. And I think that's the problem that the media is doing. They think they're helping the Democrats. They think they were helping Joe Biden when they refused to cover the story, when they refused to investigate the allegations about Hunter and Burisma and Ukraine. But it may turn out that the help they thought they were giving Joe Biden and the Democrats actually will cost Joe Biden and the Democrats the election and that the person they were actually helping, unbeknownst to them, was Donald J. Trump. He's going to be reelected. That's my take. What do you think? Leave a comment. Give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. And until the next time, stand tall, stand firm, and keep fighting.